Hello, everyone. I am Scott Kober, I'm one of the co-producers of CME Palooza Fall, and I would like to welcome you to our next session um, entitled More Than Mores, Alternate Method Methods to Measure and Report Outcomes Data. Um, this session is sponsored by Genentech. So we thank them for their sponsorship of this session. Um, it is being moderated by Eric Brady. Eric is the Director of Analytics, Reporting and Outcomes for Clinical Care Options. Um, just, just a few housekeeping slides before we get started. Um, I would like to thank um, all the sponsors of CME Palooza Fall, our gold sponsors, Genentech and Platform Q Health Education, our silver sponsors, CTI Meeting Technology, Educational Measures, iMedics, MedPage Today, Paradigm Medical Communications, and our bronze sponsors, ASIM, Clinical Care Options, CMEology, Forefront Collaborative, Global Academy for Medical <coughs> Education, Highmark CE, PVI, Real CME, Thistle Editorial, and Vindigo Medical Education. So there are three ways um, for folks to ask questions during this and all of our CME Blues of Fall questions. Um, you can use the MedPage Today text line to send in your question. The number is 267-666-0-CME. It's a zero, not an O. Um, you can click on the Google Plus Q&A link um, located at the bottom of each video. Um, you will need to have a Google account to ask a question, but I think most people do by now. And you can also tweet your question um, using the CME Palooza hashtag. And people have been using all three of these methods all, all throughout the day to ask questions, so we certainly hope um, that a lot of people have a lot of uh, questions for, our for this panel um, today. So brief speaker disclosure, um, the opinions, discussions, and or conclusions expressed are our own and do not represent an endorsement by or position of our employer, its parent company, or affiliates. However, if anyone talks about how Debonair and Suave, the hosts of CME Palooza are, um, that is a representation or endorsement by your employer mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so with that, I am going to turn it over to, uh, to Eric to get this session started. All right, thanks, Scott, and um, and and Derek uh, Warnick for the uh, invitation to be a part of this uh, CME Fall, uh, CME Palooza Fall. Um, got a the uh, the interesting thing about this session is that we're going to try to do kind of a round robin format uh, where we'll I'll, I'll introduce a single topic um, and then open it up for kind of group discussion, um, and then our our topic leader for that individual topic will. Um, we'll close that session with some key pearls um, that uh, for, you know, there'll be some key pearls that are focused for be on beginner, on our beginning outcomes learners and some that are for our more advanced folks. Um, but uh, what isn't this session? Well, if you're looking for a group that's going to sit here and disparage Moore's as a model to measure educational outcomes measurement, you've come to the wrong place. Um, if you've come to expecting us to break down every frame of the latest Star Wars trailer, not the right place, although you could certainly engage me in that later. Um, and uh, and also not the place to discuss why, even though this is Back to the Future Day, none of us currently own hoverboards yet. Um, but at any rate, what are we going to talk about? So first we're going to start out with a little bit of setting the stage and, and I'm going to ask John Ruggiero to talk a little bit about the need for greater insight into the impact of, CP, of CPD activities and, expand, and an expanded outcomes approach detailed um, in a recent Genentech white paper. Um, and then we'll get into some practical examples of how we can begin to move the needle a little bit beyond what we can currently do with Moore's. You know, how do we better assess the how um, in addition to the what uh, of, our, of our outcomes methodologies. And we'll start with Derek Dietz from Improved CME. Um, and he's going to talk to us a little bit, of, or he's going to introduce the topic of use, use of EMR data to, to better document actual change in practice. Um, then I'm going to introduce the topic uh, on the use of stimulated recall approaches in, in interview settings to better understand the why and, and performance in patient health. Uh, and then Brandy Plot from MER is going to talk to us about, or is going to introduce the topic of incorporation of the patient voice into outcomes measurement. So kind of hopeful that you will all picture us sitting at a round table, uh, each with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, um, and there are a couple of open chairs, and just invite you to kind of come in, sit down, um, be a part of the conversation, as, as Scott has invited you all to, um, uh, to, to submit questions. We hope that you will, and be a part of the conversation so that we can so that we can incorporate you into that. But uh, so let's get under, underway. Um, and for this very first segment of around, of around 13 minutes in length, 
Uh, I'll ask John to uh, talk to us a little bit about the need for greater insight into the impact of CPD activities and, exp and an expanded outcomes approach. Sure. So thank you, first of all, to Eric and Scott, and thank you to Brandy and Derek as well for inviting me to be part of the session. I feel very honored to um, be part of the panel, the round robin that Eric just introduced. And um, for those of you who know me very well, you know that I am often very interested in um, speaker fatigue and making sure that others are exposed to the forum of conversation. And um, I, I am well aware of the fact that I've often given presentations at different annual, annual meetings. And to be invited back to be part of this is, is just a great honor. So thank you for that. And I think that Eric opened up this session um, very accurately with the fact that um, we have no interest here in criticizing uh, the current models that exist that actually served a great purpose for us as an educational industry when something did not once um, exist in that place. And Moore's et al.'s model um, really helped set the foundation for what we need to do to measure the effectiveness of the educational programs that we all either support and or design. And in doing so, we really were able to address some of the individualized healthcare professional needs. Well, the reason why I'm here today is not necessarily to commercialize or set forth an advertisement for the expanded learning models for systems or TELMS that we at Genentech introduced at the Alliance Quality Symposium meeting. That is not the purpose today. It is more to set the stage for the reasons why we're having these kinds of conversations. And I do think it's very important to actually have these conversations because we're um, addressing ourselves within an, an error of healthcare reform. And as a result of healthcare reform, we have an increased push for population health management. Healthcare decisions are really increasingly being made via a team effort rather than an individualized approach. There's an increased emphasis on patient-centered as well as coordinated care activities. There's new payment delivery models. For example, there's a growth in data infrastructure and the dependency on real world data. There's this unacceptable rate of adoption from a product reaching market or a specific therapeutic regimen recommendation reaching the marketplace and then it actually being adopted into practice. Some unfolding research suggests it's about 17 years for clinicians to actually take the information that they're first introduced to and then to put it fully in practice at a level of competence or fluency. It's actually a really unacceptable rate of years for the current um, country that we live in. And so how do we actually take that and collapse that a bit? And to that end, the reason why I bring all those up as introductory points is um, we are currently working in a model or a system that um, where traditional uh, independent medical education or continued professional development models uh, are based on theories that really are not adequately addressing what the current needs are. And we need to really be open with one another as an industry about that, about that, that issue. That, that, that. And how do we expand, expand, expand upon notice, I use the word expansion, because again, it's not a critique of current models. But how do we expand upon the current models so that we move from the individualized healthcare professional need to the system-based learning need? And when I say system here, I'm speaking about a system of people, not just the healthcare professionals, but also the patients, the caregivers, the managed care decision makers. How does the entire system actually get educated and then measured to show whether or not the education worked? Now, I understand fully um, for the rest of the people that I'm speaking with today, um, and they can ask questions as well, as I know that many of you can. I understand fully that change is really based on a fluid approach of acceptance. It's, it sometimes takes us um, several different steps to go um, forward with um, in order to really adopt that kind of change. It's going to take time. And, um, you know, whenever something new is introduced into a really, really great, um, almost mechanical working industry like ours, um, it, there will be some resistance, not because of critique, but because of being prepared. And um, the one thing that I do want to stress, um, if, if some of you have not yet read it, um, one of 
my favorite readings is um, by an author named Viktor Frankl. And the name of the book is Man vs. Meaning. And in that book, <clears throat> it explains, excuse me, how Mr. Frankl's um, experience within the Nazi concentration camps um, were turned from a negative um, connotation into something positive that he and those who surrounded him could gain. And it was really about how creativity showed up in the middle of the concentration camp experience. Certainly, if people that surrounded Viktor Frankl and Viktor Frankl himself could find some light of hope within a situation like that, we too as an industry can form opinions and move beyond what we've been used to, to try to start questioning um, or at least starting conversations with one another about how we expand the horizons of what we're about to do within a new healthcare era form. Now the other thing that I wanted to mention to you just as a simple case study was um, the, um, <laughs> the creation of the product that many of us use that somehow was created by accident. And um, it, for those of you that know Procter & Gamble, Procter & Gamble had um, the idea to develop a new type of soap that was producing itself or at least presenting itself as being very toxic to skin, though they knew that something had to be done to create this soap um, to, to clean floors better than the way that um, they had been cleaned in the past. And in order to do so and to address some of the toxicity issues that they were finding, they actually hired outside consultants to actually observe the way that different households were mopping their floors, noticing that during that process that while people noticed they were being observed, they had to come up with really sneaky ways of trying to, um, to observe a more natural form of cleaning. And so sometimes the observers would accidentally knock over a cup of coffee or would drop some food and pretend that it was something that wasn't meant to happen. And rather than actually seeing the participants of this study going over and mopping up the spillage, what actually happened was people ran to their paper towels, grabbed the towel, and then wiped up the spillage rather than using the mop that they currently have in their hand. From that, over a nine-month study, the Swiffer was developed because of the need to actually take the towel and actually wipe up the spillage, which was something that was a little bit more cleaner and more efficient. It actually took someone from the outside to come in and to analyze the situation and address the situation in what seems to be a very simple solution. And the reason why I share that story with each of you is because we are so closely connected to this world of medical education, so closely ingrained in what we've been doing for the past 10 to 15 years, that at times it really requires us to open our vision, to stop acting like a cyclops and see around the corner without that single view and to ask one another how do we expand upon these models? How do we create environments or solutions that actually address what we're trying to solve though that we may not be thinking of immediately now because we're so close to the issue? So a few points of, um, of just reinforcement and key pearls before moving on to the next person. Um, on, we need to increase on, our... Oh, go ahead, Eric. I'm hold sorry. On, hold on, John. Let's open this up and, let, and, and, have, a, and have, a, have a couple of uh, Absolutely. Couple of questions or, you know, amongst us and see if, uh, see if there's... Before we get to key pearls. Great. Um, you know, one, one of the things that struck me in, in your analogy there is you know, you think, uh, thinking about the way that things get measured. You, know, you basically took a very qualitative approach to taking a look at how, or, or uh, Procter & Gamble took a very qualitative approach to assessing how people were cleaning. Um, is that something that you foresee a much bigger future for? Um, you know, we, we've, one of the things we've leaned on heavily with Moore's is, is figuring out how to best quantify what it is that what it is that's changing as a part of our educational programs. Are you seeing the advent of a day when we're going to spend a whole lot more time doing qualitative measurements? Uh, so let me answer that with um, assessing your question in two different parts. The first one was the qualitative part, and the second one is do I see evolution of current models or, or models that are being introduced? And so I'll start with that, the latter first. 
the latter being the answer yes. Um, when we introduced the, equal, uh, the Alliance Quality Symposium meeting, the expanded measurement system, um, or, or learning systems, um, or TELMS, um, we knew very well that this was a complex model addressing a complex system that was going to require solutions from everyone outside of those who authored the model. We want there to be a solving process here, a methodology where it evolves itself over time, as the healthcare system will too, and that everyone feels a part of this model. So yes, I do think that there's going to be continued evolution and continued sharing and continued outside perspectives that feed into the models that we need for the future. So that's answer number one. Okay. The answer to the second question about qualitative data, yes, I do strongly see that qualitative data is going to make um, inroads within the kinds of medical education programs that we support or provide as um, supporters and providers respectively. The one thing that um, we should just be cautious of is to make sure that there's still some element within the qualitative approach that can be quantified as well. Mm -hmm. Because as a supporter, and, and now I'm, I'm wearing the supporter hat and giving a supporter perspective, as a supporter, I quite often appreciate the quantification of data so that I can easily tell the story to our senior leadership or our medical team leadership. Okay. So if there's going to be qualitative data that's assessed and then provided in outcomes reports, I do think that um, it would benefit all of us if there's a way that that could be categorized or so how framed, summarized in a way that allows us to still tell the story using data. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that may be really important for us to all consider though before we move on perhaps to the next question or to an audience question and then to my key pearls, so thanks for interrupting Eric because I appreciate that. Um, is that um, as providers partner with larger healthcare systems to be able to do the very complexities that we've just addressed, share your reports not just with the supporters but perhaps with those systems that you're partnering with. Because the ultimate goal here, you can use education as a strong tool to help um, show those systems that they are meeting the mandates or the requirements now set on them because of healthcare reform. If those systems can take those reports and help evolve those reports as well and evolve the needs as well, those systems can start showing those stakeholders in their own system, hey, I've met these quality improvement metrics or I've met these metrics that you're expecting us to achieve now because of healthcare reform. Let's continue to use education as part of the solution for that. And that driven within the report when provided to supporters is also a very powerful message. So consider that as well. Okay, I'm, I'm taking a look at time here and I, and I do want to make sure that we give everybody uh, a chance to, to talk through their, their key discussion points and I'm sure that there are going to be more questions that come up along the way about how some of these practical examples fit in with some of what John has described here in the setting of the stage session. So John, if you would just please your, your key pearls and then we'll move in, into the next session with Derek. Sure, absolutely. So very quickly, we need to increase our understanding on the cares and gaps um, and the causation. We need to use these insights to help inform our educational approaches so that the healthcare marketplace shifts along with our adaptations and vice versa to foster some kind of system-based learning model approach. Um, we need to explore and measure the impact learning has on the needs of learners, now the systems rather than the individualized healthcare professionals, and also perhaps look at the regional care variations to help use the, them as pilots as we explore new models, and to just think about coordinating our care and our outcomes with real-world evidence. So okay. I'll stop there. Thank you for the time check, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the other two panelists give their perspective. Sure. So, uh, and thanks, John. That's a, a great kickoff for us. Um, you know, I think setting we needed to have the stage set before us to get into some of these practical um, conversations. But let's let me give way now to Derek Dietz from Improve CME. And Derek, if you would, in the next four or five minutes, try to introduce your um, your your specific topic point on EMR data. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Eric. And it's it's wonderful to be uh, on this session. With, with the panelists and with also those who are sending in questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking forward to learning from, from the other panelists and, and from the questions that are asked. The 
the CEHP community as a whole has really had a compelling desire for access to objective data on performance and patient outcomes to demonstrate our effectiveness uh, from our initiatives. And we really wanted to progress from the self-reported, the subjective performance change information to objective or data, uh, validated performance change. And some, of, some people in the community have felt like they would never be able to get access to, to the data, while others have been very successful at gaining access to partnerships and collaborations. And so what kind of data are we talking about here? What's this objective data that we're talking about? Well, really electronic medical records, EMR, mostly EHR, electronic health records, and also administrative medical claims data. So when I recently went to my uh, physician, the EHR data was right in front of the nurse practitioner who saw me first and saw everything about me. Uh, age, weight, uh, meds that I'm on, all of those things, those kinds of things. And that was her basis of uh, interaction with me. Administrative medical claims data is about how um, healthcare professionals get compensated. So it's records of procedures and, and those kinds of things. There's some fundamental differences between the two. You get some information in one and uh, different information in the other. But really the starting point for working with um, EHR data or objective data is, in my mind, and as I've talked to folks who do a lot of this work, is really to search for performance gaps first. I've seen people who have said, you know what, we need to do some performance improvement or some quality improvement in this specific area and let's, let's do this. Um, the, the real starting point is to identify what the nature of the performance gap is. You've got to nail it. And, and you've got to have access to the data to help you do that. Um, sometimes your data sources, they can assess the performance or quality improvement you want. Sometimes those data, they can't. There's a particular behavior you want to change. Sometimes that objective data can't answer that or tell you whether you've met that objective or not. So you really need to start with real tangible baseline reports of performance that validate the gap. Those also become very powerful in discussions with clinicians uh, to, to create this cognitive dissonance between what is and what ought to be. And that same kind of data is what you're going to collect after you've um, completed the intervention or interspersed throughout an intervention. And if you can't see report uh, of what you want out of the data system at the beginning of your planning system or planning process, you likely will never get it to measure your effectiveness without a tremendous amount of extra effort. So data access always begins with relationships and dialogues between individuals. For those who are seeking access, um, there's, there's individuals inside an organization or in different organizations uh, and data come out of systems. That's why the TELMS uh, approach or model, it can help us think more about this. It was always the case that when I thought about performance improvement, there's performance of systems. Or when we talk about performance uh, level changes in clinicians, that there's a systems aspect too. Over, over and over again, in looking at outcomes measurement results from hundreds of activities. It's common for clinicians to say, my barrier is I'm in a system and there's a protocol and I can't, I'm not empowered to change that. Or I'm not, I don't have access to that on my formula. Mm -hmm. So realizing that we work in systems is really important and EHR data comes out of systems. Um, so so, Derek, let me ask a, a quick question. I see, I see Scott's got one uh, coming in as well, and, and I'll invite Brandy to consider an answer to this, to this thought line as well. I mean, do, do you have some specific examples of ways that you've broken down some barriers to get access to the type of data that you're talking about? Is, is it largely built on the back of established relationships, or have you had some, some success forging new relationships that get you access to data, objective well, I, data? I, I recall one... 
a medical education company that simply had a personal contact with a senior level person mm -hmm. in the health system. And they began mm -hmm. to have a dialogue about um, you know, shared shared needs or mutually beneficial mutually beneficial relationship. They ended up being able to gain access for a price, for a purchase price, mm -hmm. of needs assessment data that was coming out of EHR or quality data for that system. Mm -hmm. They helped use that not only to, to um, get support, commercial support for education in that system, but to to validate needs and uh, build programs nationally. So that's one example. Of Brandy, do you have one? Well, yes, actually at one point I was doing a whole lot of research into this and one of the barriers I was experiencing was that we were trying to measure performance in hospital and it was very difficult because a lot of the EHR data that comes out is um, all ambulatory data. So I was put in touch with a contact that could actually help me um, access hospital charge master data. And that's some very powerful data that can give us insights into what's happening in the hospital because a lot of the major healthcare decisions um, that affect people's lives are happening not just outside but in the hospital as well. So, okay. Scott, what have you got? Um, sure. So, so this is a question that came in just as you guys were transitioning, but I think it, I think it's an important question um, to address. So. Given, one, that participants in many CME activities only participate for a couple hours, or I would probably argue even a couple minutes, and their commitment to measurement will only be a fraction of that, and two, that CME activities also often affect participants from numerous health systems with their own da data, how doable is the current emphasis on actual outcomes measures instead of survey-based measures? Yeah, is, the, is that question being uh, addressed to me <laughs> or the group? Go ahead, Derek. Yeah, so there there are certain kinds of CME that we will continue to need. We're, we're just going to continue to need certain kinds of CME that are short, shorter, that have the focus more on perhaps knowledge or competence kinds of changes, mm -hmm. and the forms of measurement that we've been using are adequate to measure those. But I think what we're saying here is that to bring about quality improvement and performance improvement, we're going to need more robust, more carefully designed um, initiatives. And they aren't always CME-centric. Sometimes what we need to do is realize that, take some humble pills, and realize that there are quality and performance improvement kinds of proven models that have been used or can be used and we come to assist. We come to assist with education for portions of that quality improvement initiative. Um, so it, it requires a kind of a change in our mentality. Instead of feeling like CME has to be the group that knows everything about quality improvement and has to run the program, we can be of assistance to others who have expertise. So I think I know how John would answer this question, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put it to him anyway. I mean, John, from a, from a supporter's seat, um, I, I I would expect that you would totally agree with what Derek just said there. That 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 there there is room. Uh, there continues to be room, you know, especially after listening to some of the the uh, the session this morning on on millennials and mm -hmm. and the way that we think edu education is going to evolve in response to their desires and needs. Um, that we're going to continue to have these types of short, more competence-focused education, but that there is a greater need and probably a greater opportunity for deeper, long-term studies that truly get at the core of, of, of systems barriers and how we break those down. Does that sound right? Uh, I don't even think I need to respond. You, you basically <laughs> suggested uh, exactly where I'm at. I, Derek is absolutely correct. I don't think anyone is suggesting that CME as we know it today is going away. There is still going to be a need for knowledge and competence and confidence building, and models exist to help us with that. There is also a need to actually address the fact that healthcare has changed. And it's now a system-based it's a system-based decision-making process, and we need to address it through those means. The one thing that I will mention, and then not take up any of Brandy's time, is that there are existing data sets that are for free out there. The Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services 
has provided a lot of free data for us to access. There's the SEER data. There's a lot of good material out there that can be used not only for needs assessment gathering and insights gathering for gap setting, but also to see whether or not after education has taken place there are changes or patterns of practice. And so consider that as you talk about the evolution of your educational programs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, just to, Derek, just how about, I was going to ask for your key pearls, if you can, and maybe a quick response and then your key pearls, if you will. Yeah. Um, I think we need to remember that uh, when we're going to, when we're considering the use of more objective data, it's going to require a, a higher level of um, educational design generally more intensive over a longer period of time. So that, that's what's just what's required. And often as a starting point for those who are involved in uh, or who want to get involved in the use of this kind of data, you really need to understand the quality improvement and performance improvement process. Learn about that first. So here are some, some pearls. If you've never used EHR data before, First, learn about the quality improvement, performance improvement process, the principles, review examples, etc., and base your intervention on da real data that you've seen. Don't just think that it'll all work out in the end because you, you, you really have a good relationship with this institution and, and they have told you, or the, the people who have the data, that, and they've told you that, yes, we can do this. You've got to see it. It's got to be in your hands. For those that are more advanced at this, you've got a, a lot more experience than I do in doing this. But here's one consideration, and, and John mentioned this. There, there's all sorts of quality measures that are out there already. Uh, what can you do to link the quality improvement measures you're looking at with existing quality measures? Let's do that integration. It makes it easier to get access to the data, number one, because institutions and systems are already reporting those kinds of things. Um, and it just integrates better. You can show your results in a more meaningful way. Those are my terms. Okay. All right, thanks, Derek. OK, so let's roll into um, the next section, which uh, is going to be, uh, I'm going to introduce the topic of stimulated recall. Um, and people are somewhat familiar with this idea. Um, it's kind of built around the concept that learners often self-identify a learning need uh, without realizing it. We go in search of a necessary piece of information, or we show evidence of, if you will, sporadic process, meaning that we're inconsistent in our practice patterns. Um, you know, that happens to us in real life, uh, and it certainly happens to clinicians uh, across the healthcare system. Um, but for those of us that are trying to assess need and design education, isolating what occurs is often easier than figuring out why something occurs. So interviewing, while it's very qualitative in nature, and certainly this is beginning to feel very much at home as a topic after, after, after listening to what you know, John said earlier, um, you know, interviewing can offer a path towards better understanding of care gaps uh, and barriers that stand in the way of implementation of those best practices. Two models that I've su seen successfully used include chart stimulated recall and search stimulated recall. Um, I think it's pretty clear what, these, what this in general means. Obviously, uh, in chart stimulated recall, you have a chart review process that, that, uh, that is undertaken. Um, and when you, you know, potentially find uh, a decision that gets made, by, a, by a, a group of clinicians or an individual clinician, and you have an opportunity to question that person as to why they made a specific decision. Um, that can give rise to um, some interesting conversations about why such a decision was made. Oh, well, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't know that I was supposed to be doing this differently, or um, you know, maybe there's some other underlying system type of barrier that stood in the way of, use, of the use of a best practice. Search stimulated recall is something for those of us that are more um, on the online education side. Uh, most of us probably log our search terms uh, that, that learners have, have executed on our site. And it's a good opportunity for us to review those search terms later um, and take a look and, and see if we can reach out and have an interview or a conversation with the person that performed those searches to try to better understand whether that search had, a pa had an impact on patients um, or, on, or an impact on, on patient care. So those are the two types of specific types of ways that I've seen stimulated recall approaches 
um, used. But in the end, again, it's it's really very much a focus on trying to transition beyond um, the what of a given educational activity and, and get into the why. So um, I'll open this up and uh, I'll start with, I guess, John and just say, John, is, is this something that, that you've seen used um, in, in, in outcomes measurement specifically and do you see a, a role for it um, in uh, particularly with this need to, to try to move beyond Mort? Yeah, um, so I don't have physical examples that I can point to that suggest stimulated recall have been used um, quite effectively. Uh, I'm excited about what you just said, and I think that it actually speaks to the self-identified needs in a larger system of needs. Um, I think that it is part of the evolution. I'm, I'm certainly interested to hear what Brandy and Derek have to say about it as well. Mm -hmm. How about you, Brandy? Any experience uh, with having used uh, any sort of stimulated recall approach or seen the, uh, the benefit of using it? Um, I think, in general, um, what I find is really interesting is to um, take some of those recalled words that we're tracking and then we've just been really using it to better um, come up with like the next part of that education um, so that we're being really more relevant to um, what the needs of our current learners are. Yeah, I, I, I think complete, and complete, completing the circle, right, um, from from where, you know, we, oh, this this clearly needs to, is a problem, and now let's let's put some, some energy behind trying to address that problem. I, I agree. I think that's a, a great, great insight. Um, Derek, any any specific thoughts on stimulated recall approaches? Yeah, I, it's common for me as I talk with um, folks putting CME together and wanting to measure their outcomes that there's this frustration over um, not being able to get enough people to answer a follow-up survey. It's mm -hmm. a very practical issue that people have. And so there are certain cases where a follow-up survey, they should have known way in advance when they planned the, the initiative that it's just they weren't going to get enough people because they know their response rates. So the suggestion is to do some qualitative phone surveys. Thing is, most of those qualitative phone surveys, they allow you to go a mile deep and an inch wide, mm -hmm. as opposed to an inch deep and a mile wide with a survey. The cool thing about doing those interviews is you can get into the system's issues. You can ask the kinds of barriers that people experience and, and, um, and have them give you a further dialogue about what that means and sometimes how they've overcome those issues. But rarely, and it, we need to progress in this, rarely is there a discussion of, at a higher level, how a system change would be addressed. Mm -hmm. I don't know if yeah. my comments are on target there, but those are some of my observations. Yeah, go, go ahead, John. Eric, the only thing I was going to say, which I think is really a transition from what Brandy first introduced and what Derek followed up with, which I thought were really excellent comments, by the way, um, don't underestimate the, um, the power of a pilot. So while you may have difficulty getting some survey responses back on a national scale, there are certainly ways where you can regionalize or localize a pilot example, even within a nationalized program, and then show some pilot data that says, hey, perhaps I can't get a great response, but using a stimulated recall as an example, I can do exactly what Derek recommends, recommended call a subset of the learning popul population maybe within one system and is this an opportunity to show that you know data is more enhanced and outcomes reports are more expanded and then I can replicate that information in future programs. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting things we can do with this expansion that if we just stop, if we pause and, and we think about just all the opportunity, it's actually a really exciting time to be in our environment. So don't resist. Take it with open arms. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. I think I think the uh, the thing that occurs to me about you know about use use of, of stimulated recall, you know, especially with your comment on on using it as a pilot. I mean, in a lot of ways, when you're conducting these interviews, it's like you're you're looking for that thread, that thread that's hanging loose that you can grab onto. That's you know that's woven into the problem and begin to try to extract it out and just kind of pull out what is the what is the thing that's really stopping us from making the absolute best decisions, but the thing that you know just the counsel that that I would kind of offer for everybody that's 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 watching here is that 
You know, I don't think that, that anybody thinks or, or expects that when we do this type of, of stimulated recall approach that we're going to do it on, on, on the entire N that makes up our outcomes population. Um, mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's, it's very much a, a question of you know, trying to find the right people to talk to that are going to give you some real insight. Um, and as long as it's, you know, as long as we believe it's a fair, or I believe it's a fair expectation that that's only going to be a very small subset of your overall outcomes cohort. And, you know, you're really trying to just, you're, you're trying to clarify what it is that you've seen um, within some of your quantitative results. And, you know, to Brandy's point earlier, set yourself up for the next round because, you know, we, you know, we really have to stop thinking about education as, as point A to point B. I mean, this is a very circular process, and we need to make sure that we're consistently looking to, you know, make, make the improvements that close this loop and then find the next ones and continue the process. Yeah, it's never, it's never bothered me that those interviews are, are with a non-representative sample. Yeah. Uh, that's not the point of the interview. Yeah, that's right. agreed. That's right. Agreed. <laughs> okay, so let me offer my key pearls um, before we before we move on to to Brandy. Um, so I've got you know a couple of key pearls. The first one is uh, for beginners. Um, you know, and when I say beginners, I mean people that are kind of starting off on their outcomes journey. Um, you know, the real question, or the, one of the key pearls, is you should consider ways that you can better assess the why within your evaluation framework. You know, we have a lot of times we have an open ended places on our evaluation where we ask, you know, what topics would you like to see in the future? You know, think about those types of open-ended questions where you can begin, you know, we, a lot of times we have a barriers question where we ask people to, to um, bucket their different barriers that they're running into, but having an open-ended after that would, would really help um, a lot. You, you, it may, you won't get many people to respond to it, but the one or two that do may have some very valuable information to share. Um, another Another key pearl, does your system allow you to examine what learners are searching for? Um, again, more, t more oriented towards kind of online um, education providers. Um, you know, if, if you are collecting your search terms, or if you don't know if you're collecting your search terms, you should look into that and take a look and see if there's something there that can steer you in a direction towards a, a refinement in your needs, needs assessment and your overall outcomes design. Um, a more advanced clinical pearl, um, a good interview script can carry you a long way, but listen for the yeah right and follow that thread. You know, and that's you know, when you're when you're talking to somebody and 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 you know maybe they it's clear that they'd like to go a little bit off script. Um, I inc absolutely encourage you to continue to chase that down and find out what it is that they think is really wrong with a given you know with a given question that you're asking. And then finally, um, my last key pearl, you know, recognizing the whys is only the beginning. Think big picture. Um, you, need to, you need a process to break down those systems barriers. It, yeah. It's one thing to identify them. It's another to begin to put some process in place that begins to, to, to break them down and remove them from the system. Okay. Uh, so, so, Eric, Scott, let, yeah. let, let, let me jump in with a question um, that Go just ahead. came over. So, uh, uh, so here's the comment. These approaches are all very cool, especially approaches to objective measurement. Some also sound really expensive to implement. Any strategies for funding or accomplishing these inexpensively? So, I mean, I, I, I'd like to hear what other people have to say, but I mean, I, I think, you know, if, if, when it comes to interviewing specifically, um, you know, there is a bolus of effort and labor that probably goes into, uh, that definitely goes into building the script that you want for a given activity. Um, but I, I think the actual time that you spend um, interviewing people, I mean, I generally do it over the phone when I'm engaged in that. Um, you know, it's anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes, and then I've got to roll it up. Um, so I, I don't know that I, it's a kind of a question of just how expensive that is outside of just the fact that, you know, you 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 probably need um, a uh, 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 somebody with pretty high competency in, in, in medicine to be able to conduct that type of interview. Um, but I, I honestly, I, I think, I, I agree that there's a bolus of effort in, in terms of labor, but I think over time, you know, as well as your fund, as well as you've, you know, you, you haven't cut your, your outcomes budget down to a bare bones, it, it doesn't break the bank at, at least, but I, I'll defer to Derek who's I think has something to add here too. I guess this is my low-tech way of, of saying I have a comment. Yeah, that's fine. Um, you can raise your hand. <laughs> um, I can see pilot, you. Pilot, pilot, pilot. Yeah. When, <laughs> when it's a new approach, mm -hmm. the pilot, 
that lowers your risk. Use those descriptions in your grant request that yeah. lowers expectations. We know it's an experiment. Try it out and, and learn from there. You will always be able to make tremendous improvements after yeah. a while, or you're going to say, it ain't going to work. Well, and I and, would and add on. I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. I would add on to that. I was going to reemphasize again the idea of pilots um, to control cost and um, the need for partnerships. We're not in a healthcare market anymore where we can solve all this alone, and we have to be cognizant of that. Um, it's a realistic gut check. Um, the the other thing to mention would be again reemphasizing the need for really searching out free things that exist a lot of healthcare data is out there as a result of healthcare reform. It's mandated, and we have access to it. Use that to your benefit. Well, and I, I want to clarify one thing, um, and then I'll, and Brandy, I'll, I'll give you a chance to. Okay. I don't think this is an approach you use on every grant. I think this is an approach that you use in, in very specific instances. I mean, you know, I think most of us are accustomed to using baseline and post on on the majority of our of our grant opportunities to try to assess competence change. But this is not the type of activity that I would that I would counsel should be undertaken on every single thing. I mean, this is for your this is for your more um, expensive grants, um, but and also ones that, that you have an expectation are going to have a, a very high level of impact. You're Grant. speaking about stimulated recall as an example, correct? I, I am. I am. Yes. I'm, it's about interviewing techniques and stimulated recall. I think that's the type of thing that, that isn't for every grant. That's correct. Though system-based learning is the new way. <laughs> Doesn't mean that we're getting rid of knowledge and confidence. Sure. System-based learning is the new way in healthcare. So yep. that's just something for everybody to realize. Right. And I think we have to get it out of our heads. I think, you know, we're kind of um, raised and born to think that, okay, if it's more expensive, it's necessarily better. And that's not always necessarily the case. Sometimes the least expensive option may help you achieve the best outcome overall. Really good point. Mm-hmm. All right, so uh, let's let's transition into into our fourth and, and final topic here. Brandy's going to introduce the to the uh, the topic point of incorporation of the patient voice and outcomes measurement, and then uh, we'll do the same round robin and close out with her with her key pearls. So go ahead, Brandy. Awesome, thanks, Eric, and thank yeah. you. Uh, I'm so honored to be part of such an excellent panel and have the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, so I may only be speaking for myself, but I am of the opinion, and I think many people are, that there is an excessive focus in continuing education and outcomes measurement on the clinical aspects. But um, we, uh, in my opinion, if even we could consider um, impacting the life of one patient, then most of us would consider our education a success. Um, and when you think about Moore's levels of outcomes, there's a pretty large gap that exists between measuring the patient outcome to actually improving patient outcomes. And involving patients, looking at the big picture of things that we've been discussing throughout this presentation is really a big way to bridge this gap. So including patient engagement and shared decision making in continuing education and outcomes measurement is really key to kind of to making CE a bigger picture and including the entire team, the patient being the end, the end user of all of this. So now as you already know, shared decision making is really a process in which clinicians and patients work together, the keyword being together, to diagnose and manage their condition based on both clinical evidence and patients' informed preferences. And there are many non-clinical factors that affect patient outcomes. Um, some of those include adherence, cost insurance coverage, access to care, cultural barriers, a huge one is health literacy, and finally trust. And when we talk about patient-centered care and shared decision-making um, and how they can over help overcome these barriers, um, patients want to be treated by clinicians who are good listeners, um, who are good at educating them about their disease or condition, we're going to treat them with empathy and respect, and who will involve them in decisions that are being made about their well-being. So there's quite a bit of evidence out there that patients who receive patient-centered care are not only more likely to trust their clinicians, but they're going to adhere to treatment recommendations and are going to be less likely to even die following a major health event like a heart attack. 
So in other words, my point in all this is that you have to have the patient buy-in to achieve better outcomes. If they're not involved in their treatment or care and they don't have agreement, then it's more likely that those barriers I just discussed are going to have an even bigger factor in all of this. Um, so not only should future continuing education focus on improving clinicians' ability to practice patient-centered care, but we should also be measuring this. Um, there is a lot of literature out there that says feedback from patient reported outcomes measures can not only improve diagnosis and management of patients' conditions, but it can also help to increase uh, patient engagement. And most importantly, completing the loop and providing clinicians, again, we've got to complete the circle with patient feedback can help them be better informed of unique needs of individual patients and can really aid in future communication with their patients in the future and, and help get that buy-in um, in shared decision making. Um, so how can we obtain patient feedback? Well, there are several ways. We can use quantitative measures like surveys or also, um, as we've been ha having in this discussion all along, more narrative qualitative measures gathered um, on or before the clinician-patient interaction. Um, those are also, by the way, very cost effective and again, it's not always the most uh, costly way of uh, obtaining outcomes that, you know, we're always helping achieve the best result. So, um, so that's really uh, all I have as far as the didactic portion of this presentation. But mm -hmm. um, if you have examples, it want examples of, you know, questions that can be included in patient surveys or how to go about this, then definitely uh, I, you can contact me after seeing me, Palooza, and I can point you in the right direction to some resources. So thank you. So, John, I know you're a big proponent of shared decision making, or uh, certainly Genentech is. Um, is. Do you have anything you would add to, to Brandy's points about the incorporation of the patient voice? Yeah, so um, shared decision making is such another uh, complex topic that I'm sure that we could talk about for another hour, and I know that we don't have the time to do so. Um, I think it's setting goals appropriately and relevantly for where we are in the current space. So do you have to answer all the questions that shared decision making as an educational grant could answer at this current time? No. But perhaps think about what are the specific goals that you need to address for this year and then for the next year and then for the following year. There's a bunch of different kinds of goals that healthcare systems themselves are trying to address with the patient voice. For example, increasing patient satisfaction, the clinical aspect of patient satisfaction, increasing communication after patients have felt comfortable setting their own goals and believing that clinicians have listened to those goals. Uh, of various um, different reasons for having shared decision-making processes. And I'm glad that the patient um, could potentially be part of upcoming educational activities. Yeah, I'll, and I'll just, I'll, I'll add that, you know, one stumbling block that I've seen um, with, with shared decision-making um, is too heavy a reliance on assessing uh, the physician's um, outcome from shared decision making. I think Brandy's on point here when she talks about making sure that we're assessing the, the patient's satisfaction. Mm -hmm. they, are our, they are our customer. Um, and I think that they're, you know, we, we certainly have tried um, to assess shared decision making types of outcomes. Um, and it's, it's tricky because you, you, have, you have clinicians who in general terms don't believe that they are bad communicators. They, you know, that, that's, that's far, to ask them about their communication skills is far more personal than mm -hmm. it is to ask, um, ask them about their knowledge of a specific disease state. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's just a, something, you know, that, that's a, something that I would kind of comment on and just make sure that people are, are thinking through when they're thinking about, you know, how do you, you know, how do you best assess patient health? Um, you know, it's certainly best done through, through patient surveys or, or patient um, uh, narratives, as Brandy said. Derek, anything to add? I just wanted to say that um, there's such rich information that can be used uh, at early planning stages through uh, patient interviews, through collaborations yeah. with um, patient advocacy groups that uh, many folks are, have experimented with, but there's a lot of room for improvement there. Uh, to, and, and understand the patient journey through a system, through care, through these interviews. And sometimes there's very inexpensive ways through partnerships and social media to collect that information. Mm -hmm. I think very good point. Yeah, and yeah. these are the kinds of things that Brandy and Derek are bringing up as examples that 
I myself am thinking of, but it's very difficult for me in my position as a supporter to give those kinds of suggestions. I don't want to give the impression that I'm, I'm leading the development or the design of an educational program, but they're, they're really highlighting the kinds of conversations that I think even supporters are having, just hypothetically representing a supporter. So I, I think it's good material to, to heed. And just as an FYI, sorry, Derek, do we, are we running out of time? We're, we're starting to run short. I was going to ask for your key pearls, but go ahead and make the okay. point that you were hoping oh, I was, to. My other point is there's something out there called the Healthcare Hashtag Project, and to Derek's point, um, you know, you can hashtag different patient disease states on social media and get lots of patient information up front before you're, during the planning stages of your education so that you can have a great baseline for the types of information that you're going to try to get after the fact as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brandy, would you mind sharing your key pearls and then sure. and we'll see if Scott has anything um, before, we, before we close up our session. All right, thanks, Eric. So absolutely. Um, so some of the questions you should be asking yourself, does your um, education and outcome strategy involve patients? Um, are you including ways to um, help educate clinicians on uh, being better patient-centered caregivers and on shared decision-making? Um, what non-clinical barriers are really impacting the patient's health um, other than just the clinical aspect of education? And then um, are you completing the loop and providing clinicians with that information? And for people that have been um, a little bit more advanced in outcomes, how can you use larger audiences such as social media and patient um, healthcare hashtags to access information on larger populations? Um, also, geo-targeting is a great way to, mm -hmm. um, is to get more regional information on that. So. Yeah, that's a really good point. Those were great. All right. Um, well, uh, I think we're, we're running a little over, so um, I want to thank all of you for your participation in this session. I know there was a couple questions that we weren't able to get to, um, but, um, but I think that, that you guys covered a lot of really interesting ground. So for people watching this session, um, if you haven't already, if you could please go on to um, our survey at the top of the live tab. It'll give us a sense of um, who's watching CME Blues of Fall. And this is kind of the one, one way that we're able to get outcomes data. Um, and for those folks who want to view the next live session, which is our Pecha Kucha session, um, you will need to uh, refresh your browser after this session is over, and that session will begin shortly. And uh, I just want to say, John, I'll be looking forward to your moderation of the More Than Mops Alternate Methods to Clean Spills in American <laughs> Household <laughs> Session. Very clever, Scott. I do want to apologize to everyone listening as well. I, my biggest fear was that I was going to be photobombed during this session. <laughs> you probably we're now a new open environment, and it's very difficult to get a close space to do this. So yes. thank you for being patient with me, everyone. Okay, well, thank you all, and um, we'll hopefully see you all soon. All right, thanks, Scott. Thank all right, you. Bye. All right.